I first went to stay with John Fu, I ran into a paradox. I was there because I wanted some freedom. Freedom from a lot of the issues that were eating away in my mind. But I found that I didn't know how to handle the freedom I found there. This was just conditional freedom. It wasn't the unconditioned freedom that the Buddha was talking about. Just the conditional freedom of having a whole afternoon with nothing to do. No, no duties, no responsibilities. As John Fu made clear, my only responsibility was to stay with the breath. And my mind was overwhelmed at the prospect of that kind of freedom. Overwhelmed in a sense I didn't know what to do with it. Didn't know if I could handle it a whole afternoon with nothing to do. And I watched my mind as it was trying to find ways of filling up the time. This is a common problem we all find as meditators. We think, only if I had more time to meditate. And then when you do get more time to meditate, it's overwhelming. You fill up your days, and then you find yourself doing other things to fill up your time, looking for chores to do, looking for things to read, because you can't face the freedom. Part of you is afraid you feel bored with nothing but focusing on the breath. Nothing but sitting, and then walking, and then sitting, and then walking. And part of the fear comes from the sense that you don't know how you're going to measure progress. Because the mind does have this tendency to go up and down. It seems to make some gains, and then it loses them. Then it makes some more gains, and it loses them again. Back and forth like this. And the mind state that wants to measure things in terms of what was gained by this hour or what was gained by that feels lost, being able to thrash around. This is where discipline comes in. You have to learn how to discipline yourself so as not to waste the free time you have. The first thing is to remind yourself you don't know how much free time you do have. You never know when illness will come, or death, your own death, the death of someone else around you, which will cut short your time here. All, think, all sorts of things can happen. Crazy people may decide they want to have a war. It's not just their own personal war, it drags lots of people into chaos along with them. So you don't know how much more time we have before that kind of chaos hits again. This is why the Buddha's reflections on the world are important. He defines the world simply as your world of sensory impressions. But it's not a monadic little world. It's going to be influenced. It's going to be touched by other people. And although he said that reflections about whether the world is finite or infinite, eternal or non-eternal, are a waste of time, reflections on the fact that the world is swept away. It does not endure passage we chanted just now. It offers no shelter. You have no guarantee how much more time you have here, or how much longer social stability is going to last. One of the passages that King Ashoka singled out as important for Buddhists to keep reflecting on, the series called Future Dangers. The monk reflects, I'm young now, healthy now, I'm alive now. Society is peaceful, the Sangha is harmonious. But when these things change, it's not going to be easy to practice. So while I have the time, the monk reflects, I should practice and try to attain that which 
I haven't attained yet. See what I haven't seed, seen. So that when I do face aging, illness, death, social unrest, say a potential split in the Sangha, my mind will still be at ease in spite of those other things. In other words, this is what heedfulness is all about. It's to remind you that we don't have all the time in the world. You may even not, not even have all the time in a day. So use these thoughts to focus your mind on the present moment. You've got this moment right now. Don't waste it, because you don't know how many mo more moments you're going to have. You sit down and you think about a whole day with nothing to do, and the mind begins to fill up the day with all of its paisley patterns. So stop that thought right there. So you don't know how much time you have. You've got the opportunity right now to be with this breath. There's that famous sutta where the, the Buddha reminds the monks to be heedful, to reflect on death every day. And not just every day. He asks the monks how often they reflect on death, and some monks say, well, once a day I reflect on it, and some others say twice a day. And it gets to the monks who say, I, if, while I'm eating, I remind myself, if only I get to live as long as it takes to swallow this morsel of food, I'll have the opportunity to practice the Buddha's teachings in that moment. Another monk says, if only I can live one more in-breath, one more out-breath. I'll have an opportunity to practice the, the Dharma in that in-breath and out-breath. And the Buddha comments, it's only those last two monks who really count as heedful. Everybody else, he says, is heedless. You've got this time to practice, but you just throw it away. Because you spend the time thinking about endless vistas of days, or a whole day here, just with nothing to do, no pressures. For those of us who are used to the pressures of work, of having limited time, we've learned to thrive within the confi confines of those pressures. But suddenly when the pressure is off, the mind loses its bearings. The mind that's normally very active and pro proactive becomes passive, loses its direction. So this is why the Buddha's perspectives on karma, his perspectives on time and the world, are an important part of the practice. There's nothing in his teachings that's there just for abstract speculation. It's all part of the training. He talks about aeons of time. He always brings it back to the fact that the experience of where you're going to be in those aeons of time depends on what you do. And where you're going to see what you do, well, you see it right now. You don't see it anywhere else. This is the point where you can see how the mind fashions its realities, how it fashions its worlds. So you have to be as sensitive and as precise and meticulous as possible in looking into the present moment and having a very strong sense that this is very important right here, right now. It's a rare opportunity, even when you have two whole weeks or three whole weeks to do nothing but this. That time passes. And when it's gone, you want, you don't want to be the sort of person who says, gee, I didn't take advantage of it, or I got sloppy, or I got careless. All I could think of was filling my time with styrofoam peanuts, shredded paper, i.e. the stuff with which we fill up time when we don't know it have anything better to do. But here we do have lots of better things to do. The problem is it's, it's one of those jobs where you can't measure your progress with a ruler or measure your progress with material things. If you churn out papers or have projects, it's one of the useful ways we have especially for the monks to maintain their sanity. As a John Fuang once said, if you do nothing but meditate all day, you're going to go crazy quickly. It's for this reason. 
But if you have chores, it can make sure they don't occupy your whole day. Have a little time every day for a chore to give yourself something where you can at least look at this and say, well, at least something got accomplished today. Because as the Buddha noted, the job of wearing away your defilements is like the handle on, a, on an adze, which is kind of like a little carpenter's axe, a small axe for carving. As you should know, over time, the, the, the use of the ads will wear away the handle. But you can't see it being worn away from day to day to day. So this is where conviction comes into the practice, why conviction is such an important part of self-discipline. That even though you don't see it, you know some good is being done each time you bring the mind back to the breath, each time you try to focus as precisely as possible. You're creating new habits. That's a long-term process, a long-term project, so you have to know how to give yourself pep talks along the way to keep yourself going. You don't want self-discipline just to be the ability to push yourself through drudgery. You want to be able to make the project as entertaining as possible, as interesting as possible, as enjoyable as possible, to bring as much enthusiasm as you can to a process which without the enthusiasm just dries up. So squarely face the, the fact that you've got a big project here, I mean, all these huge defilements in the mind, but they don't come as huge boulders all at once. They're just little tiny things one by one by one as they come through the mind. And they come in lots of different guises. Anger, for instance. There's not just one reason why we're angry, which means that you work through one type of anger and then it's not going to work through all the kinds of anger you have. But it will give you some ideas on how to apply to what you've done to other types of anger as well. Anger gets built out of lots of different narratives in the mind, and different ones will get activated by different events. When you've seen through one kind of narrative, i.e., the way certain events recall a type of relationship you had when you were a child, and here come, seems to come that relationship again when you learn how to see through that misassumption, okay, that you're not being forced back into a restricted place where you were when you were a child by this new event. Okay, you've seen through that, that particular narrative. There are other narratives for anger, just as there are many narratives for creed. So there are lots of these things you've got to learn how to work through. So just because you see through anger once, don't get discouraged when you find that anger coming up again in another guise. Keep reminding yourself, okay, this is a long-term project. There are lots of ins and outs. As the mind once said, you look at the animal world, and it's so variegated. All different kinds of animals. each with its own special little niche, its own coloring, its own peculiar tools and shapes and forms, ways of behavior. And the Buddha said, you know, the human mind is even more variegated than that. So we've got a lot to deal with here. But it's not an impossible task. It does take time. Fortunately, we have the time now. So make the most of it. These windows in time don't come all the time. You've got the window right now. Make the most of it. It's a paradox. You know, discipline leads to freedom because it makes, helps you make the most of your free moments. Without it, everything falls apart. Remember that expedition that Shackleton got into in Antarctica. And so many times it looked hopeless, but the men were well disciplined. They knew that if there was any hope at all, it was going to lie in maintaining their discipline. And that was, that was what saw them through. Shackleton made a lot of, looking back on it, what turned out to be 
wrong judgments. But the discipline of the party got them through even his misjudgments. So your mind, in the course of the practice, is going to make some false starts. As we were mentioning today, there are times when it, other issues come up in the mind and they really are worth looking into, and other issues turn out to be distractions. And how are you going to know beforehand? You don't know beforehand, but you'd give them a try. First line of defense always should be, as you're practicing concentration, other issues that come up are not what you're here for right now. But if they come up persistently, you have to look into them to see why they have such power over the mind and what their drawbacks are, why you really shouldn't have to listen to them, learn how to see through them. That requires getting involved with them for a little while. And if you find that getting involved with them is useful, it helps you understand some issues in the mind, well, pursue them. But also learn how to read what's going on in the mind so you know that when it's just turning into a major distraction and all you are doing is reliving old issues, it's time to pull out. Learning how to read those telltale signs, again, that's something you have to learn from trial and error. We don't like trial and error, but it's the only way you're going to learn in the mind. So even though there may be false starts, wrong decisions that you make, the element of discipline is what's going to see you through. And it's the discipline that makes the most of freedom and actually yields in a higher freedom. So you learn through trial and error how to apply that discipline, how to develop that sense of self-discipline. You've got the time now, so do it now. It's not going to happen instantly, but working on it is what you can do now. And there's no other way it can be perfected.